Talking not that of a maestro, more like that lizard from Geico. When I lick, 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 you go psycho. Downtown, I'm more famous than Michael. My game, I gave it to Tyco. Gene Simmons of my time, whoa, got my control, damn control. Up to your spine and back down to your toes. Melt you, little mama, like pie and mode. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Xander Effect. I'm your host, Xander Dames. In entertainment news, John Mayers uh, talks about his reaction to his ex's Jessica Simpson's new memoir book on uh, on Watch What Happens Live with uh, with uh, Andy Cohen. Talk a little bit about that. UFC 249 has found a home a little bit north of Fresno in uh, California. We'll talk a little bit about how they got away with that one. And in video game news, we have... Uh, uh, the new Call of Duty uh, downloadable content is out. Talk a little bit about what is included in that DLC. And I uh, have an awesome special guest today on the show, actor Jeremy Miller. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a friend of mine uh, that has come on the show a few times as my uh, my uh, fantasy football correspondent. Uh, he had, he's very knowledgeable in football, but he is also uh, the actor that portrayed little Ben Seaver in the 80s hit sitcom called Growing Pains. He was also the voice of Linus in the Peanuts Gang. He's got a lot of stuff to talk to me about, his experiences on set, um, you know, his relationships with his cast members, including Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Alan Thicke's uh, son, Robin Thicke. Uh, you know, he'll talk a little bit about all that. Plus, you know, a little bit about his, uh, his romance romantic adventure shall we say and not to, not to mention that but he also talks about he gets very personal and talks about his uh struggles with uh, alcohol addiction and uh you know so much more so so many so many more other things that he talks about but first before we get into that here uh-huh. is b taylor and do browns it's on me right here did. on the xander fan i believe it though <laughs> one life Same game, be telling. What up? Woo! So we kick it like it's kickball. Power couple. She dripping in that they'll say goodbye. They want to touch her. Everybody know that's do girl. What you going to do by Me and her take on the world. Now that's a true rider. And she be on saying, no, I ain't her own class. Hella book smart. I be grabbing on a real life. Since it's on me, I'm going to put it on you. Sipping on the best of the best. We playing taboo. Care City 305. I'm a dirty baby. Help you with your homework. Now we getting dirty, baby. Drinking dirty slippery, baby. Got a new tiptoeing. Because I made the right moves. Got a new Going, she be in my lap snoring. I should call you FaceTime, but I got respect for her. I'ma spy your face now. I never poke a big dog. We be hella outside. Never have a side to choose, cause it's only one side. Step right up to the VIP. Yeah, the IP, VIP. Yeah, yeah. Don't wait, cause tonight's on me. It's on me, baby, it's all on me. Yeah. Sexy models, champagne bottles. Yeah, the IP, VIP. Brown, make a lot of noise. Yeah, yeah, we them bad, bad boys. All you ladies ain't got no damn choice. I said me and do bad, bad boys. A, A, flow where them girls at. Yo, yo, shop where them girls at. D, D, money where them girls at. I'm trying to party where them girls at. Cause after the party, it's the after party. After the party to my hotel lobby. After the lobby to five in the morning. It's just me and you. There's only one side. Right up to the Yeah. 
VIP, V V I P. Don't wait, cause the night's on me. It's on me, baby, all on me. Yeah. Sexy models, champagne bottles. Yeah. The I P, V V I P. Got two models, three more bottles. Auto and a model, got a bottle on the one side. B Taylor, yeah. The I P, V V I P. It's on me, baby, it's all on me. Can never get enough of that song. That was It's On Me by B. Taylor featuring Du Brown right here on the Xander Effect. In entertainment news, John Mayer has reacted to Jessica Simpson's recently released tell-all uh, memoir. Uh, it's called Open Book. And Jessica Simpson ha- talks a lot about her life, her career, but she definitely talks a lot about her relationships and the things that happen in her diff- various relationships relationships right before she got married it, uh, obviously she's talked about Nick Lachey uh, she's talked about Tony Romo but one another another uh, ex that she also spoke about was John Mayer we all know that John Mayer and Jessica Simpson uh, dated for a while and apparently uh, he, he was on uh, on a vir- virtual video chat with Andy Cohen and watch what happens live and Andy asked him about you know the subject came up about the uh, the memoir and John Mayer was very, uh, like, he really didn't care too much. I mean, he, he basically he basically was like, you know, he quoted Pee Wee Herman in, uh, in, in Pee Wee's uh, Big Adventure. And he says, quote, as Pee Wee Herman says in Pee Wee's Big Adventure before the movie of his life is about to play out at the end, he's not watching the movie. And the reason he's not watching the movie, he said, uh, uh, he's not watching the movie, he says, I don't have to watch it, Dottie. I lived it. And I think that's prescient here. So at the end of the day, like John Mayer just sees it as, you know what? I was there. I, she, I don't need to read what she said. I was there. I lived it. I, you know, I went through it with her. Um, John Mayer did, you know, she did go ahead and mention uh, about John Mayer um, pretty much making her feel very insecure about herself. She kind of blamed Mayer for her and Tony Romo's split as well. And, um, you know, uh, Jessica Simpson also says in her book, she says, I know that he's publicly apologized and don't want to take that away from him. I think he knows a lot of this about me already, but he doesn't know the perspective I have as a woman. That was just in her 20s. So Jessica Simpson is basically admitting that, yes, Mayer did uh, apologize for certain things, certain comments that he had made about her after their split. And, uh, you know, she recognizes that. But at the same time, she does she does make mention of what what Mayer actually put her through. And and again, Mayer is just like, well, you know, I've already been there. So been there, you know, know about that. Let's move on. So, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, Mayer's probably taking it a a lot lighter than uh, than uh, than uh, than any of her other exes, or maybe the other exes are actually taking it the same way. They're probably like, dude, it's in the past. She's writing about the past. She, you know, obviously she has something to say. She has she felt some way about the way we were together, and she's writing about it. So it is what it is. We were young, you know, we were barely getting started in 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 our careers. So it is, you know, say la vie. It's over. It's done. We're older now. And it's, it's in the past now, you know? So it is what it is. In other entertainment news. So as promised, I went ahead and uh, told you guys last episode that I watched the Big Show show on Netflix. And, man, I got to tell you, that show was awesome. It was really cute. I wouldn't say it was the most hilarious, you know, uh, uh, sitcom that I've seen. It had a lot of funny moments. Uh, the cast are very, are very talented. I was actually pleasantly surprised at how talented Big Show uh, is as an actor because I had never seen him uh, be in anything other than reality television when he was on Hogan's Knows Best and he was only on there for like a brief, like one episode or so. And, you know, it was it was a pleasant surprise to see how he actually interacted with his co-stars, with the three little girls that were, that portrayed his daughters and everybody else. And I, I was, I, I enjoyed it. It was a very cutesy, very nice, uh, very nice show to watch. If I were to grade it, I would have to grade it probably maybe, you know, uh, anywhere from an A- Minus to a B plus type of show because it, it was it was really nice it was really sweet it kind of took me back a little bit 
to how sitcoms used to be and, you know, the life lessons that they learned. So they t- they grabbed a little bit of that. So I would actually recommend it to a lot of people to go ahead and take a look at it. Uh, if you, you know, seeing as everybody's at, you know, staying at home, go ahead and bid- binge watch the Big Show show. I would recommend it for you and your family, especially if you have little ones. Uh, definitely go ahead and watch it. I would have to say that the one that stole the entire sitcom show would have to be the little girl, JJ. That girl is hilarious. She's a little hustler and she's just comedy. I mean, I, you know, you guys got to watch it to know what I'm talking about. So yeah, definitely watch the Big Show show on Netflix. It's currently, uh, it's currently streaming on Netflix. So so check it out. And speaking of sitcoms, I had an awesome opportunity to sit down and, well, (laughs) video chat mostly, uh, and chat with uh, former child star Jeremy Miller. He played Little Ben Seaver on the 80s sitcom Growing Pains, and he was also the voice of Linus on the Peanuts Gang. Got a chance to talk to him, and he had a lot of awesome things to talk about, a lot of awesome stories to tell me. But before we get into that, here is Obet featuring Freedom. Sweat right here on the Xander Effect. We go party. Xander Effect, I have actor Jeremy Miller on the line, and Jeremy Miller, in case you guys haven't uh, seen uh, my my past uh, episodes, my past newscast, he's he's been on my show as a uh, as a sports correspondent, he's done a phenomenal job, he's really sports savvy when it comes to uh, when it comes to football, and uh, you know, I thanks to him, I kind of won the fantasy uh, league in our league, so thank you for that, Jeremy. 
Um, but what you I, many of I got to hear about this for a whole nother couple of months. <laughs> but what you guys probably uh, don't realize, or or what you do realize, because I actually have mentioned this at, at every time I introduce you, is that Jeremy is actually a former actor. He was on a very incredibly popular show back in the eighties called Growing Pains. He played the little brother Ben Seaver on the show. He also did the voice of Linus in the Peanuts Gang. And before Jeremy, I had you on the show to talk about sports this time i actually have you on the show because i want to talk about you about jeremy miller the actor and everything you've done um you know we've we've had uh, interviews in the past before but never on the xander effect this is the first time that you come on the show to actually be interviewed as an actor and i gotta tell you it's 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 one of the lowest points of my life but i'll take I'm, it <laughs> it's rather <laughs> It's rather underwhelming, isn't it? <laughs> no, absolutely not, man. Guys, I got to tell you, Jeremy is not only uh, one of my best friends. He's like a brother to me. He's like family um, and one of the greatest guys that you'll ever meet. Uh, so definitely, if you ever see him on the street, you know, go ahead and tackle him for an autograph because he's really cool like that. But, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. You know, um, but aside from that, uh, I got to tell you, Jeremy, you know, your experience in Growing Pains was incredible. I mean, you were there since what, Since what? you were eight years old, something like that? Yeah, uh, we filmed for seven years, so it was eight years old to 15. So at that wow. point, it was quite literally half my life. Well, I got to ask you, before we get into that, uh, before we get into how you got uh, started there, and this might be a brief uh, description of how you got into acting to begin with, because, I mean, at eight years old, there's not much that you had before <laughs> you know, acting, you kind of started at a very young age, but how did you get started into acting? How did you get involved in that? Well, actually, let me correct you there. I did start well before that. I actually started at five. Oh, okay. Uh, that's when I began. Uh, it was really kind of random. I, my mom put me in singing classes mm -hmm. and I always loved to sing as a kid. And there was this little place out where we lived or near where we lived called Mickey Rooney's Talent Town. Mm -hmm. And Mickey Rooney had set up these little talent studios for kids to be able to go and learn dance and singing and acting and pretty much any sort of entertainment, you know, art that they wanted. And even got to meet Mickey a couple times before he passed. It was really, really awesome. Nice. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the teachers there, one of the voice teachers, whose kids were already auditioning and were doing, you know, a lot of voice work, just kind of mentioned to my mom, she was like, have you ever thought about putting this kid on TV? He never shuts up. He's kind of got the personality for it. So, <laughs> and, nice. you know, mom had never thought about it. There was nobody in my family that we knew of at the time that was ever in the entertainment business. Um, but as my mom tells it, it kind of, clicked something in her mind because I used to walk around the house even at five years old reciting the lines and scenes from Brady Bunch and Chips and all my favorite shows. <laughs> nice. So you already had the bugging you you know at a very young age as it was. Without even really knowing it. So you know mom just kind of came to me after vo uh, vocal class one day and said you know hey what would you think about trying to be like one of those kids on TV? And, you know, to a five-year-old, five-and-a-half-year-old, I was like, that sounds fun. <laughs> so and, in such a nonchalant fashion, like, eh, you know. <laughs> five, what else, the, what the hell else was I going to say? <laughs> and, um, you know, I was blessed enough that I truly fell in love with it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And so, so you started at that age. Were you doing commercials or, I mean, before, before you got cast in Growing Pains, were you doing any commercials or anything? Well, I actually booked a commercial, a McDonald's commercial that was supposed to be national, ended up only being regional, but I booked a McDonald's commercial within my first 10 auditions. And of course, me and mom were looking at like, oh, this is easy. Okay. <laughs> nice. Um, but it was actually a, a decent little group of us on that McDonald's commercial. Mm -hmm. It was a kid named RJ West who went on to do a bunch of different shows during the 80s. It was a young kid named Brandon Call who went on to do a bunch of shows during the 80s, and also Jaleel White. Wow. Wow. And, and the thing is, it's so crazy that you mentioned Jaleel White because he actually, um, he actually, because on Netflix, there's a brand new show called The Big Show Show. Uh, it stars uh, former WWE wrestler, uh, The Big Show, Paul White. 
and I know who Big Show is. I know, but just in case the listeners don't know who the, he is, that's why I'm describing it. <laughs> so give me a break here. Um, no, that's not our relationship. <laughs> that's very true. You're right about that. You get no slack. That's very true. You're right about that. I hate you for that, and I love you about the same time for it. Um, but yeah, he, he actually, I just got done binge watching that show. Jaleel White is actually on that show. He guest stars from time to time, and he plays a pretty funny character. Hey, Jaleel's awesome. Him and I didn't really hang out much when we were younger. Um, just we were at different, you know, different parties, different uh, uh, Hollywood events and stuff like that. But he was always a good guy. And we've reconnected a few times later on. And, you know, he's just awesome. He really is a great guy. Seems to be really devoted to his family. And just it's great to be able to catch up with those old friends of mine. No, it's no, it's really cool, man. So I'm, I'm wondering, okay, so you started like right here. How, how did you get the call for growing pains? I mean, how did that all happen? Growing pains was more of a cattle call. Um, I'd gotten a bunch of stuff. I actually went through a dry period after that first commercial, of course, mm -hmm. uh, almost two and a half, three years. I didn't oh, wow. get anything like 450 plus auditions, uh, I was regularly going to producers, which is the final calls. I was regularly down to the last two or three kids, but I just never booked anything. So it wasn't as easy as you and, uh, and, and your mom had, had imagined? Oh, no. We got introduced to the reality of it real quick after that. Ouch. And you'll find this part, you know, interesting. I always have. We were right at the end of our rope. I mean, my mom was a school teacher. We didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. She was divorced. We were getting a lot of help. I mean, my father was no deadbeat dad. He always took care of his responsibilities, but mm -hmm. it still didn't go quite far enough, especially when mom had to devote almost all her time to driving us around to auditions and stuff. And things mm -hmm. were getting very, very tight. And mm -hmm. mom sat me down after an audition and said, you know, I only, I don't think we have more than a month or two left of this. You know, mm -hmm. we, we really can't keep going. And, um, you know, we just got to pray something comes through, but if it doesn't, you know, in the next month or two, we're going to have to, you know, give up on this. And I swear to you, as soon as we started praying about it really hard, um, within like a week or two of making that decision that we were going to give it this much more time, I started booking left and right. Wow. I wow. booked, a, um, I booked a extra spot on Charles or on different strokes, which actually ended up getting bumped up to a line, which then later got cut out. Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but I got to work on one of my favorite shows, got to meet Todd and Gary and Dana and all them, you know, mm -hmm. many, many, many moons ago. And um, then Charles in charge and Punky Brewster and, Prior's Place, which was this amazing Saturday morning variety kids show that Richard Pryor was producing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just started booking left and right. I got a movie, horrible film called Eminon, but I was one of the leads of it and got a wonderful review, even though the film was just a disaster. But the <laughs> LA Times said me and my buddy Max, who was played the limo driver in it, were the two shining moments in the film and that we both had a lot of, you know, a bright future. You guys future. were the highlights. You guys were the but highlights. They, of they said, and that, you know, we both had a bright future ahead of us. And mm -hmm. then I, Deceptions, which was a big TV movie. It was a uh, mini series when those were still popular in the 80s. It was 1984, uh, Barry Bostwick and Stephanie Powers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew to London and filmed out there the whole time. It was amazing. My first time on a plane, 10 hours. It was uh, interesting. Wow, But, you know, I just started booking left and right. And within, like I said, I got back from, uh, I got back from filming Deceptions and I went out and got a couple of more interviews. One of them was for a show called Fathers and Sons, which was mm -hmm. starring Merlin Olson and was slated to be a big show for NBC. And I also went out for this show called Growing Pains with a failed talk show host as the lead <laughs> and uh, i'm just telling you where we were at at the time yeah i, yeah. I ended up going to both uh i went to producers on both of them and then was requested to screen test for both of them mm -hmm. well when you screen test you have to sign the contracts and get everything settled beforehand or at least back then you did mm -hmm. 
So you couldn't screen test for two at the same time and we had to make a decision. And I basically, oh, wow. it, they basically told us I had both and we had to make the decision. Oh, wow. And my agent, of course, wanted us to take the Merlin Olsen one. NBC was much bigger than ABC at the time. They were hot. Um, Merlin Olsen was a bigger name, especially, you know, Mr. You know, Mr. Dad, he was the dad of the time. Mm -hmm. And Alan, you know, was the failed talk show host in America, although, you know, was an amazing talk show host up there in Canada. Mm -hmm. And everybody except my mother and grandmother wanted me to take the fathers and sons show but my mother and grandmother had a feeling and something in them told us that we needed to go with growing pains and the rest is history wow talk about talk about a crazy decision and making the like the the the, the right one actually because growing pains went on to become a hit tv show uh, at the time and and it's crazy because i i just i, I remember hearing that they actually did a recast and they recasted the big sister, the role of the big sister. I remember that. Yeah, Carol was actually recast after the pilot. Um, we I mean, did. were you nervous? Were you nervous that you might be on the chopping block as well? Oh, not a bit. Um, <laughs> that stuff never really came into my mind. First of all, I was young, so mm -hmm. it didn't really, you know, I didn't think about that stuff. And we didn't know what was going on with them recasting Elizabeth Ward, who was the original Carol in the pilot. We didn't know any of that until they had basically picked us up and we were coming back to film our initial 13 episodes. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know she was no longer a part of the show until we were already signed and picked up as a show. Wow. We met Trace, found out that Elizabeth was no longer a part of it at a photo shoot three days before we were supposed to start filming the show. Wow. Wow. So that we, must have been crazy, though. It was interesting. Um, I mean, none of us, I mean, I had a, you know, we only worked together for a week and a half, two weeks. So <clears throat> it's not like I was incredibly close to Elizabeth, but we all worked together. Me and her and Kirk were, you know, friendly. Mm -hmm. and, and she was gone and there was Tracy. And of course, I absolutely love Tracy and had a wonderful relationship with her. But yeah, it was kind of interesting to show up and all of a sudden they were like, uh, yeah, this is your new sister. <laughs> wow okay that's just weird <laughs> that must have been really weird but at the same time that's showbiz I mean but you know in saying that uh you and Tracy had a good relationship how was your relationship with the rest of the cast with Kirk you know with uh Joanna with uh, with you know with uh with uh with uh, Alan with everybody how was your relationship with everybody because that you guys it would seem that you guys all had an incredible chemistry together on screen how was it you know behind the scenes it was exactly the same. Nice. Um, I really believe one of the reasons the show was as successful as it was, um, was that we were a real family behind the camera. I mean, we really were as close as a family. Alan was a second father to all of us. Joanna was a second mom to all of us. I mean, we, and it wasn't just the cast. We knew the names of our grips kids. We had wow. met, you know, we had a 200 person crew we knew their families we knew their kids we were a, a huge family and that came through and you know we always looked out for each other as well that's amazing that's really cool because you don't hear that that often anymore you know nowadays you hear everybody just as soon as they yell cut they all go their separate ways not too many people are that close uh you know behind the scenes so that's really cool to hear that and you know you guys you guys were on the air for a very long time you know, how was it like growing up? You know, because I know, you know, you were eight years old, but then you started hitting your teens and that awkward time. Um, because I mean, I know Tracy, she hit the awkward time. She went through a little bit of, uh, through a little bit of, uh, of issues behind the scenes that, you know, have been reported before that she had uh, an eating disorder because of what was going on. Like, you know, the body shaming that, that, that she was, uh, you know, that she was, that she was getting as well. And, you know, everybody had their own issues. I mean, how was that like for you growing up, getting to, you know, becoming a teen and, and just being around all that and, you know, just all, all that type of experience? There was a lot of plus and minuses. I mean, I always tell everybody I wouldn't trade any of it at all. And mm -hmm. I had my share of bad experiences, but the 
amount of incredible experiences and things that I got to do and lives that I got to touch over the years far outweigh any of the negatives. Now, does it mess with your head? Absolutely. Every school I went to, every school after Growing Pains started, as soon as I walked into the new school, every girl wanted to date me, every <laughs> guy hated me exactly because of that. It was very hard to make friends. It was very difficult to know who was your friend, really your friend and who was just kind of using you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot of social things that were very interesting and kind of hard to navigate. Um, I was very blessed that I had a mom and grandma who really kept my head on my shoulders. I mean, I may have been, you know, one of the hottest child actors around at that time, but I also had chores and I had to do the dishes. <laughs> you had to be a kid. I had to do my homework. And, you know, if I spoke to my mother, like I saw quite a lot of my friends during that time speaking to their parents, I'd have mm -hmm. been picking my head up off the floor. <laughs> uh, so, you know, those things kept me grounded, you know, um, kept me from getting too big of an ego. I mean, I was a confident kid. I was, mm -hmm. but I wasn't an arrogant asshole. That came later. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I could vouch for that part. I beat you to it. I beat you to it. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> you can't leave the door open for me like that and just, and just walk in before I could, okay? You can't just cut me off like that. <laughs> Sorry, had had to had to jump in on that one for you, but you know, it 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 really helped having a family that was really involved like that and helped kind of keep me on the straight path. You know, mm -hmm. my my family never put the paycheck above my well being, my behavior, my growth as a person, any of that stuff. And unfortunately, you do see that a lot of that. I think you see even more of it now that the. Uh, monetary figures have gotten so astronomical. And social media. Well, I mean, social media is another part of it, but let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, mean, I did very, very well on Growing Pains. I mean, very well. But this was, we're talking 80s, 90s TV money. Mm -hmm. Angus, whatever his name was, from Two and a Half Men, in year seven of their show, was making $350,000 an episode. Wow. Kirk never made that an episode in our entire time. Wow. Being the huge star he was. Neither did Alan. Okay, that's the difference in the money. Now, was Angus a big part of that show? Absolutely, a crucial part. But was he one of the headliners, one of the main two? No, he wasn't. And he's still making that. He was the young kid making the least. And that's what he was pulling down. You know, I didn't, I, I, I think in my best year, I came close to that in the year. So the numbers are astronomical now. Do I know for sure that my mother faced with losing a $20 million paycheck wouldn't have caved? I don't know. We weren't dealing with those figures. I believe my mom wouldn't have, but we saw a lot of parents who put the paycheck first and allowed their kids to basically do whatever they wanted because they were afraid the kid would say no and they'd lose their meal ticket. I mean, I, I, have, to, I have to say that, uh, you know, your mom, I love your mom to death. She's just an amazing person because she really cared for you. Um, you know, and, it's, and, and you've told me this before because I, I've asked you if, you know, because you hear all these child actors talk about that they were sexually molested, abused, all that kind of stuff. That never happened because your mom was right there, like making sure that that did not happen. You know, well, I mean, that's exactly it. Mom, my mother did not allow me to just run around Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a time when I did start being on set more by myself as I got a little older. But mm -hmm. that was as both of my younger brothers were born. My mother was taking care of newborns at home. But even then, I had people on set looking out for me. And you I could, had my set. And, and, the, uh, and, and I'm sorry to cut you off here, but you also had the fact of the matter that you grew up around people that protected you too. You know, I mean, Alan, Alan Joanne, uh, you know, Kirk, Tracy. That's exactly what I mean. Everybody on, set, everybody on set protected you know, and looked out for us um, as the kids on the show. 
that doesn't always happen, unfortunately. But our adults were very, very conscious. Now, that being said, we had two people who, after Growing Pains went down, who were very close to me and who were on our show, who went to prison for pedophilia-related offenses. Wow. Wow. How, how did you react when you heard about that? I'm sure you were shocked. Um, one of them, yes, I was shocked. One of them, it was that moment where they said it and things clicked and you went, oh shit, that makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> so I'm assuming that, I'm assuming that, you know, you witnessed a few things that were a little questionable about that person. So, I can, I can talk about it. I mean, it's well-known public, you know, stuff. One of our produ executive producers, one of our big three, um, a man named Steve Marshall. Mm -hmm. was involved in production of child pornography. Wow. And he went to prison for multiple years afterwards. And that was the one that it kind of clicked because he would always be on set when we had young girls in bathing suits or, you know, he'd always be hanging around when we had skimpily clad this and that. He was one of our main writers. They'd write things in like, the episode where I was trying to shoot a little home movie and I've got 15 local teenage girls in bikinis in what's supposed to be like winter weather. Wow. And of course he was on set quite a lot during that time. And there were just a lot of things like that. A lot of younger girls, not always under 18, but very young, you know, 17, that area is 18 that would come on and the writing and the things that were done were sexualizing them a lot. So yeah, it, it kind of clicked. Things made sense um, when we heard about that. Now, another person who worked on our show, um, I don't know exactly what happened. He was a big part of my life and had many, many, many opportunities to be inappropriate, and he never did. So it's hard for me to, um, it was hard for me to believe it when it first was brought against him. Again, I don't know the details of the case, but he did serve time and, if I'm not mistaken, ended up on parole for quite a while from it. So, again, I was around it. I mean, this was, this was a guy who drove me to work for two years and was one of my very close friends on the set. But you, were we, it, you were never a victim of it, which is a, which is a very good thing. That's what I mean is, is I don't know his reasoning for never making an attempt. I don't know if this was something that happened later and was blown out of proportion. I don't know. Um, but I do know that there were two people who were convicted of pedophilia offenses. and I was around them on a regular basis. So had I not been as protected, had people not looked out for us as, as much, who knows what would have happened. Wow, that's that's just disturbing to even think about, man. To be honest, with you, that's crazy. But I'm I'm glad that you know that that you weren't one of those uh, victims that I've heard a lot about in different stories uh, from well, other actors. Unfortunately, I I am actually a victim, but it was never with anybody in the industry. Yeah, well, that's that's what I mean. That's what I mean. And how is how, I mean, how did you deal with uh, with that other experience? Uh, I blocked it away as much as I could. Um, and then later on, when it hit me full force around 18, 19, 20 years old, I dove to the bottom of a bottle. Yeah, that that part right there was uh, something that, um, you know, and I and I, you know, I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about, you know, how, you know, you got into that portion of, I'm, of your I'm life. an open book, you know that. I know, I know, but I wasn't, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I mean, folks, for, for all, for most of you, I mean, you, you have gone public with it, you know, many times uh, that you are recovering alcoholic. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, that, that I, I could understand why, you know, the triggers, um, because most, uh, most people that get involved in addiction, it's usually triggered by something. And obviously yours was triggered by, by, uh, by a moment in your life where, where, you know, you were abused and that's, that's what triggered the alcoholism. Well, I'm going to get on my soapbox here for a minute. Um, people want to say that, you know, pot is a gateway drug, that this is a gateway drug, that that's a gateway drug. The fact is the number one gateway drug in the world is trauma. 
Mm-hmm. Plain and simple. You want to talk to the addicts, alcoholics, trauma is at the root of almost every single addiction. And the numbers state it. They show it out. They play it out. It is very clear. Mm-hmm. And that's very true. And that's very true. I mean, that's the reason why a lot of, uh, that's the reason why a lot of uh, adult film actresses, you know, they, they get into, into uh, adult, you know, adult movies, or they also get into addicted to drugs and everything like that because of childhood traumas that they had in the past, the majority of them, at least statistically speaking. Statistically um, speaking. Yes. And that's the same with addiction. Um, it is the way that most of us deal with the pain of that trauma uh, is trying to find something to blunt it, to numb it. And, um, you know, when you don't have the tools to deal with it properly, and, uh, you know, that's one thing that I have to say, being a child star in the business does not equip you with is uh, life skills and tools for dealing with things in reality. that's not really anything it prepares you for at all. And I believe that's one of the reasons why so many child stars do get so messed up and go down so many different bad paths. Um, I could imagine. But, you know, it, it really is. It was just easier. I mean, I couldn't face that pain. There was nothing in me at that point in time that could have even done therapy on it. I couldn't talk about it, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I don't doubt it. I don't, I, I don't doubt it. And I mean, it's, it's something that's without a doubt, very difficult for, for anybody to go ahead and, and be able to like express, you know I mean? And you went through it and I mean, at least, at least you're coming out off of it better, a better person, you know, you're, you're, you've dealt with it and, you know, you're trying for other things in your life, which is a really good thing. So proud of you for that, man. And, and, and I mean, you know, it wasn't all bad. I mean, also like you have great experiences, great experiences. Being That's a said, there's, there's nothing I would trade, you know, for all the experiences I missed out on as a kid or all the parts of my life that were not normal, maybe in a negative way. For every one of those, there's a hundred other experiences, man. I mean, when I was 14 years old, I got to speak at the UN to 81 heads of state. Me, I stood in front of world leaders and gave a 20-minute talk and speech on how we needed to protect children's rights across the world. And I helped get a, basically a a nationwide, uh, a worldwide pledge ratified by I don't know. I don't remember how many nations it was. The only two we didn't get to sign was us and Iraq. Um, But basically guaranteeing children's rights across the world, making sure they had proper health care, making sure that was a number one priority of governments across the world. How many 14 year olds get a chance to do that? Very true. How many 14 year olds get a chance to go every Christmas to different hospitals and brighten a few kids days just by being there? And passing out a few toys. And I mean, I never got the big kick out of meeting me. I never, except for meeting Stallone when I was 10, there's not an actor I ever really geeked out over meeting. Well, you you also, I mean, you also, dude, you also got an opportunity to also meet a lot of wrestlers too, because I'm, we're both kind of wrestling fans. So that's a lot of like, when you, when I hear the stories that you tell me, it's freaking awesome to hear this stuff. Because I'm like, I, 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 I hate you because you got to meet him. But the stories are awesome, you know? But I mean. Getting, getting to meet Bobby Heenan, yeah. which is what really set it all off for me. Um, we were filming the Kids' Choice Awards at Universal Studios. And I was one of the co-hosts. And of course, Bobby was one of the presenters on a few things. And basically the running bad guy throughout the show. Yep. Uh, Hate to break anybody's mystique there, but Bobby Heenan was one of the kindest, gentlest, most wonderful human beings I ever knew. Uh, and he, you can ask any wrestler, they'll tell mm-hmm. you the same mm-hmm. thing. And, and uh, man, he started getting me backstage to all the different events to meet the guys. And anytime, you know, Saturday night main event would come to, um, you know, the forum or come to LA or any of the big events, and he'd make sure I had tickets, make sure I got backstage to meet the guys. Uh, I pretty much met everybody during the 80s. That's Um, awesome. 
you know, everybody except for Jake and Piper. Those were my two guys I didn't get to meet until much uh, later. Well, that's really cool though that you got to that you got to meet them. But besides here here's uh, switching lane here for a second. Besides growing pains, you were also the voice of Linus on the Peanuts gang. How was that? Like how did you how did you get casted in that? That again was just a random, you know, a random call and it was one of my first voice auditions. I, I think I'd only done one or two before that. So it was my first time going into a recording studio, not having anybody to play off of and just kind of reading a script into a microphone. And um, Lee Mendelson, who was the, basically the brains and the motivating force behind every Peanuts film and television show, his production company brought them all to television and life. Um, he hired me on the spot, basically. He said, my voice reminded him of the original Linus more than anybody he'd ever heard. Nice. <laughs> um, That's which awesome. I didn't know at the time the original Linus was a woman, so um, I'm not sure how I felt feel about that, but... <laughs> Well, at the time you had a high pitched voice, so a lot of you I, know, I mean, dude, I was eight, you know, yeah. Eight so, so, it was, so it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't like it's an insult. It was kind of like, well, you know, I mean, you have a high pitched voice, your, you know, your balls hadn't dropped yet, so exactly. <laughs> but no, it was quite an honor. I mean, it really was. As a kid, like any kid during that era, I was a huge fan of the Peanuts, mm -hmm. and truthfully, to this day, it's one of the things I'm most proud of. I mean, along with growing pains, but it it's just such an enduring to be a part of such an enduring legacy like the Peanuts is really an honor. No, and that's awesome too because I mean, it's like whenever I watch, you know, whenever I watch uh, one of the one of the movies, I'm like, oh my god, that's Jeremy. <laughs> like, it's so eerie to hear your voice. It's weird, you know. It's like I know that guy, you know. Or when I watch Growing Pains and I see you, I'm like. I know that guy, you know, it's so weird, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like, who would have thought that we would have ever actually met, you know, that was probably the best day of your life. I, I, I know, but you know, still, I mean, yes. you know, no, let's not mince words, <laughs> but I mean, the, dude, your experiences on that show were amazing. Now I got to go ahead and ask you about the romantic portion of your experiences. Cause I know you dated um, you know, a couple of people, I, I know for sure the, the, the quote love triangle that you had between Candace Cameron, uh, well, Candace Cameron, Bjorn now, but back then Candace Cameron and Danica, Danica McKellar, you, you were in the middle, but not so much <laughs> in the middle, I guess you might say, because they featured you on dancing with the stars because Candace yeah. or, or Candace and Danica were both competing against each other. But then they were also competing for your love when back when you were a little <laughs> kid, apparently, which is kind of funny. So, I mean that, you know, you dated, you dated, um, you softly, I guess, dated Candace, uh, but really dated Danica because that's who you, you wanted to actually date from what I remember. Um, but you also dated Drew Barrymore. Uh, and you also dated, um, God, I can't even like, what's her name, uh, from Charles in charge. Uh, uh, she played now, Jane. Nic Nicole and I did not Nicole date. Eggert. Nicole Eggert. Nicole Eggert and I did not date. Um, but yes, there was some involvement there. <laughs> okay. So, so another date, dating would be a loose, uh, loose description of that one, but, or, there are, description, or, yes. or an asterisk actually on that one, I would have to say, but I mean, you, dude, how was it like, you know, you know, being with, with these women that every other guy in America wanted to be with every other teenager wanted to be with, how was this like for you? Honestly, that part of it didn't come into my mind much. It really didn't. Um, it was always nice at that time uh, getting a chance to date someone who was also in the industry. You didn't have to question their motives. Mm -hmm. um, I worked very hard to get Danica to go out with me. Oh yeah, I I, you know what? Go ahead and tell the story. I love hearing this story. Every time I hear it, it's freaking hilarious. So please tell me, tell the story of how did that happen? Okay, well, I'm only twelve. She was like almost fourteen or already fourteen, so she's a couple years older than me and wasn't you know didn't really want to give me the time of day. We had started going on these little trips, um, Teen Beat or Bop. I can't remember who would do it. 
would pay for these trips down to like Palm Springs and San Diego for a bunch of the the child stars. And, and really and quick, they, before, really quick, let me cut you off real quick. For those of you that don't know who Danica McKellar is, she played the the love interest in on the Wonder Years uh, of uh, Fred Savage. Really? Winnie, she played Winnie Cooper, uh, Fred Savage's love interest, uh, you know, uh, in, in The Wonder Years. So, and, of course, you, we all know who Ken's Cameron Beer is. She played uh, DJ Tanner on, uh, on Full House. So, go ahead. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So, like I said, she wasn't really giving me much time of day. Um, at the time, apparently, I was still dating Candace. I didn't remember it quite like this, but uh, <laughs> Candace swears this is the way it went down. So her memory is probably a little better than mine. Uh, anyway, so we started going on these little trips down to San Diego and stuff like that. And Danica was always going, and I just really kind of fell for her. And I started trying to kind of weasel my way in, get to know her a little bit, get her talking to me, and, you know, asked her out a couple times. She wasn't interested. Uh, I was not going to be deterred. So this happened to be uh, like 88, 89 area, right when Batman was coming out. The original Batman Michael with, Mi Keaton with Michael Batman. Keaton. Yeah, yeah. Original. And this was the biggest release Hollywood had seen ever. And it was actually such a big premiere. And it was had so much anticipation that they actually rebuilt uh, the area around the two theaters they were doing the uh, screenings in to look like Gotham. Wow. And I was in Westwood and it was one of the hottest tickets in Hollywood. You couldn't get a ticket to this premiere. Mm -hmm. And thankfully it was a Warner brothers film. And I just, I was like, Oh, this is my shot. Yeah. Because growing like, is part of Warner brothers. Exactly. We were a Warner show. We were Warner the entire time. We worked on the Warner lots. I knew everybody in the offices. So I called up our PR department and I said, you guys got to get me tickets. I need two to the premiere. Do whatever you can, please. And sure enough, they called me back, uh, I don't know, four or five days before the premiere and um, told me I had the tickets. So I called up Danica and asked her if she wanted to go. She, of course, did. That was my, my in. And I, of course, put on the show. I, uh, rent, I rented us a limo and uh, took us out to dinner beforehand and we went to the premiere, we went and had uh, ice cream afterwards at this little shop out in Westwood and sat and talked for another hour or so and really got to know each other. And, you know, she kind of, she kind of fell for me. I won her over. So nice. we started. Yeah. So I had to put in some work to get her to go out with me. But um, when I dated Danica later, or uh, when I dated Drew Barrymore later on, I met her at the premiere of Kirk's movie, Like Father, Like Son. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was kind of her normal friend. Mm -hmm. At the time, she was still dealing with her addiction. She was still going out and partying. Um, I wouldn't hear from her for like a week at a time. It was very worrisome. Mm -hmm. But she always call. And I think at that time, knowing what I know now, I was kind of that safe friend who she could come to and talk to. Um, and then Drew and I got to see each other many, many times later on. And um, she's always been incredibly sweet. and except for the first time we saw each other, uh, she's always remembered me. Uh, the very first time, I think she was still recovering a bit and uh, it took her, took her a while to um, kind of register who I was. But wow. yeah, I mean, does, very, she, does she, does she, does she still like, do you still keep in contact with her? I mean, she's, you know, I mean, cause I know that you still keep in contact with Candace and uh, with Danica and everything. I mean, do you still keep in contact with Drew? No, Drew and I never really kept contact after, um, you know, after we had broken up. Uh, and again, it was, you know, this is kid dating. I mean, it really is. We'd get together occasionally. We'd talk on the phone all the time. I mean, it's kid dating. But after her and I kind of broke up, I mean, she was dealing with what she was dealing with. I had no clue. Um, mm -hmm. She went through her recovery period and all that stuff afterwards. We didn't really talk. So um, when I would see her out and about at events in, you know, in Hollywood and stuff, I'd say hi, I'd go up and give her a hug and we'd talk for a few minutes, but that was about it. We never really kind of, you know, exchanged numbers to talk later or anything. Wow. Well, I mean, it's that, that like I said, that's, that's definitely something that uh, many guys no doubt envy about you is that you got to date. I, I'm one of those guys, um, but, you know. <laughs> I, I, not that I didn't, you know, 
wasn't just infatuated with with Candace or with Annika as well. But Drew being, you know, who she was, Firestarter being one of my favorite movies back then, and Poison have, Ivy. Ooh. Have seen what, well, dude? This is before Poison Ivy. Oh, but so. it was before, yeah. But um, you know, Firestarter and ET and all the other things she had done that I was a big fan of. She was, in my eyes, a real celebrity. Mm -hmm. you know, above me celebrity and for her to pay attention. That was, you know, yeah, I was, I was kind of blown away that, you know, her and I started dating and became friends like that. Well, that's really cool. I mean, but besides, besides, you know, that big of a star that, that, uh, that you were involved with, you also had a friend that is now a huge Oscar winner, Leonardo DiCaprio. He started in growing pains and dude how is that like to see him like how much he's grown like how how big he got it's really awesome i mean i i will not say that any of us could have predicted this but there was always something special about leo mm -hmm. and i've told this story before i am not in any way saying that i am responsible that i helped coach him nothing like that but when he came on the show me and our um, dialogue coach would work with him because if you watch the first few episodes, he's very stiff mm -hmm. and he's not real natural and he's just not coming across great. And, you know, we're seeing this funny, goofy, loose, laid back guy every day and it's not coming through on screen. So we kind of sat him down and started just telling him, dude, you got, this is, we got to see you. We got to see you on the camera. And we started working with him, working on his lines, working on his stuff. And you can really see a difference right around the third, fourth episode that he did. It's just, he kind of takes off leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And it was just to watch that progression. And then after the show to watch him, but uh, you know, to just boom. Um, I mean, I was in the trailer uh, we were in our school school trailer doing our schooling for the day when he got the phone call that he had booked uh, This Boy's Life, the Robert De Niro film. Wow. And I mean, he literally leapt about four feet into the air into my arms and was like, <laughs> I got the De Niro film. I got the De Niro film. <laughs> That's really cool, though. That is just so amazing. And to see him go on, I mean, was just incredible. I mean, I'm still... I'm I'm a huge fan of his work. I really am. Um, you know, Titanic helped bring him huge fame. It happens. Romeo and Julia the, too. Well, it did, but um, Titanic really put him on the map. Yeah, it really did. Yeah. I personally feel it's his weakest performance in anything he did, and I didn't really enjoy it. Everything else he's done, I absolutely adore. The man's brilliant. I thought it, uh, one of the biggest travesties in. Oscar history is the fact that he did not win Best Supporting Actor for Gilbert Grape. Mm. His yeah, performance in What's Eating Gilbert Grape was not only on par with Dustin Hoffman's Rain Man performance, in my opinion, it surpassed it. And wow. for him not to have been rewarded and acknowledged for that performance was an absolute travesty. Well, you know, they, the, you know, the Oscars made up for it by giving them a couple of other statues. So, <laughs> no, I'm, and I'm, and they are well deserved. But yeah. truthfully, I've been rooting for him for a long time for all of that. Everything he does, I look forward to seeing. He's he's an absolutely brilliant actor, and um, you know, wonderful guy. Uh, hadn't seen him in a long time. We I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you if you'd seen him since then. Well, we used to run into each other after the show and before he, you know, fully blew up and became, you know, ultra uber a lister. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd run into each other at Jerry's Deli at two in the morning, or we'd run into each, you know, and we'd we'd sit down and talk and have, you know, have dinner. And I'd join him and his friends, or he'd join me and my friends, and. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then there was a period there, especially when he really blew up where we just didn't see him. And, you know, I'm not a, a person who is going to reach out and try and suck up or do anything like that. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't see him making an effort to reach out and it wasn't a bitter thing or anything else. It's just because of the status he had achieved. I'm not going to make that first move. and 
you know, put it into his head, you know, why is he reaching out now? Of course. Uh, we reconnected at Alan's funeral mm -hmm. and it was a really, really touching moment. Um, Leo showed a lot of class. I've told this story before, but it was, it was a real class move on his part. Uh, he's a very good friend of Alan's son, Robin Thicke. Mm -hmm. and Which is another person that, that you also kind of grew up with as well. Are you kidding? That was my other punk little brother. <laughs> we'll get to that one. We'll, we'll get to that one in a second. But so, what happened at the at the funeral? Well, um, again, Leo's good friends with Robin, so mm -hmm. it wasn't just that he was a part of Growing Pains that he was there, but he's also a family friend, and he was there for that as well. And I believe Robin and a couple others came to him before the funeral and because of his status and who he is, they asked him if he'd like to get up and say something. And to his credit, Leo said, I wouldn't feel comfortable about that. How about we all get up as a family and we do it together? Wow. Me, that's awesome. Him the cast. Um, that was a class move. That was a really class move. Very much so. Um, I respected him greatly for that. On top of that, he told a story about Alan, which I really, I didn't know. And I did know the first part of it. Right after the show, when Leo was getting really big, he gave an interview where he really kind of disparaged his work on Growing Pains and being a part of it. And mm. basically said that he was embarrassed to have been a part of it. Wow. That's, wow. That's really and, messed up. Yeah. So there's a little bit of hard feelings about that. And when we were up on stage, she told a story, and it's not something anybody else knew. After that happened, Alan wrote him a really long letter and basically checked him and just <laughs> said, you know, hey, I don't know who you think you are, but you need to remember your start, and you need to remember what got you where you are now. Very the true. people who worked with you and that you owe that respect to. And he just, he laid it out for him. And apparently it really hit home with Leo and he kind of changed his, his outlook and realized he was kind of being a little arrogant and it just, he, it really, it really hit home with him that Alan did that and it changed his, his behavior and his outlook. And he kind of apologized to all of us for having done that. And it was, uh, again, just a class move. It humbled, so, him. I mean, it humbled him greatly. Absolutely, it humbled him. And, you know, that's the kind of magnitude Alan had. It really is. Um, I'll tell you another, you know, another story about the funeral. Um, Bob Saget is one of Alan's oldest friends. And Bob got up at the funeral and he said, you know, the fact is I was in a lot of rooms with a lot of people. You know, De Niro, Pacino, doesn't matter. When Alan walked in the room, he was the coolest guy there at all times. <laughs> he seemed really cool, too. And it's just, that's who he was. And he had that magnitude. He had that love for all of us and that respect we all had for him, that he had the ability to reach out to Leo and say, dude, what are you doing? That's not right. And to his credit, Leo took that to heart. So... That's really cool that at least he 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 recognized it and you know he realized it and he got humbled from you know by by Alan and that's an amazing story but I mean you know Alan I I could tell that he was the coolest the coolest cat that you know that I that that's that was in the industry and really nice guy too from from what uh, from the stories you told me uh, does the apple far uh, fall far from the tree when it comes to Robin Robin's awesome. Um... Him and I don't, you know, talk a lot, you know, we're not really, really close or anything like that, but we grew up together. He was on set all the time, mm -hmm. being close, at least to my age, we always palled around. Um, as I've said, but him and I were frenemies because we were always competing for like Candace's <laughs> other other girls who were on set and stuff like that. Nice. But his age, you know, he, he was basically the same age as my little brother. So at the time, I always just looked at Robin like my other punk little brother. And we were always friends. And he's, I mean, he's a great guy. He really is. I mean, he's had his issues, you know, all that other stuff. But the guy I know, he's always been a wonderful guy to me. He's very sweet. And, you know, he was a good guy to be a buddy with back then. And that must have been, that must be crazy to see how, like, how Robin Thicke has, like, 
kind of blown up in the music industry, you know, over the years. I mean, what did you, again, did you ever imagine that that would happen with him? Yes. Not shocking at all. Um, well, like follow he, like because I know that I know that Alan was involved in a lot of jingles and a lot of uh, a lot of um, you know uh, music scores for a lot of TV shows, commercials, movies, yep. theme songs, etc. Alan was a singer. He plays sax. He plays piano. He writes music. His Robin's mother was Gloria Loring, who was a nineteen you know a singer in the seventies and eighties. Did a lot of classic you know beautiful love songs and all this other stuff. He comes from a musical background. He was raised with it. It's in his blood. And truthfully, when I'd go over to their house and him and I'd hang out, I can't remember a time when he didn't have a keyboard set up in his room that he would be messing around on. Wow. Well, so that, then, was, then it wasn't he that was surprising. He was always singing. He was always singing. He was always playing music. In fact, he was on our show a few times. And the last time he was on, he was playing one of the lead singers of a boy band that I was trying to manage. And it was him and Brian Green and one other guy. Wow, that's crazy. That's awesome, though. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Like, it, these stories are amazing, Jeremy. I mean, but besides, but besides Growing Pains, you know, I mean, how, well, first of all, I, I want to ask, how was the last day filming the final episode of Growing Pains? How, how was the cast? How was the feel, the emotion that was, that was, uh, you know, the aura, you know, on set when you guys knew you were filming your final episode, because I mean, the other character, the, the, uh, the not too talked about character is Ashley as well. She's, you know, somebody that, you know, many people, cause she showed up as the baby. She's the one that was born later on, you know, you know, a few years later. Um, and not many people really give her, you know, credit or pay attention to her, especially when it comes to reunions, they really don't include her. And I know that you've shown a little bit of, of, um, you know, it kind of uh, upsets you a little bit that they don't include her. It pisses me off. I've been the one, you know, fighting to make sure she's included in this stuff from the beginning, and it just never seems to happen. Um, Ashley was a great part of the show. She was a wonderful addition, an absolutely adorable young talent who has grown into a phenomenally talented young actress. You know, she's got a a brilliant role on Blind Spot. She's one of the most popular characters on there. Mm -hmm. She's an amazing actress. And it's just a, a joy to see how far she's come. But yeah, she's never been included by most, you know, news outlets or fans or anybody. I don't know why they don't associate her with us as much. Um, I personally have always, every reunion we've done, every interview we've done, I'm always trying to ask the producers, you know, I'm always reaching out to Ashley and trying to get the producers to bring her out as well. It just never seems to work out. But I think, I think, I think and, and this is just my theory, I think maybe it's because, you know, uh, people were so used to just, you know, just you five that you know when the baby showed up when the baby you know when ashley uh came into the picture people were more like but we're so used to you five now it's you six it's not it's something that you know that uh maybe the audience weren't too weren't too uh w didn't never got accustomed to at, at the end of it which is very possible because she was you know only of that age for the last two years mm -hmm. she was a part of the show for the sixth season and seventh season so that is very possible, especially because those were not our strongest years. So mm -hmm. I can see maybe our fans have tried to block those years out. Yeah. Of their <laughs> uh, I know I have. <laughs> I try to. I mean, I'm not being mean. I'm not. But that last season in particular is not something I'm proud of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but how? Well, so how was how was you know the the feelings, the emotions when you guys knew you were pretty much you know this is it, this is the final episode. How was that like? Well, let me give you the pre story to that. Is we didn't know it was our last episode at first. Oh wow! One month before we're supposed to shoot that, they came to us for our final episode of the season. It was going to be this big intricate fantasy episode where Chrissy has this dream and we enter the dream. It was awesome, dude. I got to, I was going to play a tr the troll in her dream, the troll <laughs> under the bridge. Nice. And 
they had me, I got to go and meet Rick Baker, special effects master genius legend Rick Baker, and do a latex casting for my my latex, you know, face and all the different mm -hmm. things. So they were setting it all up and we went on a two week hiatus before we were gonna film this. And over that hiatus, we got the call that we weren't being brought back. Oh man. And our producers had to adjust and write a final episode show. Oh man. Oh, that must've been heartbreaking for all of you. Literally right up until the end of that, we thought we were getting an eighth season. Wow. And how was uh, like how was it how was it filming the final episode? It was brutal. The filming the last episode was emotionally brutal. And to add to it, Tracy was struggling with her anorexia just the most at that point. That was the mm -hmm. most critical time at that point during that season for her own safety. Our producers basically kicked her off the show. Oh man. She oh, was forced she was forced to go to basically check herself into a hospital. She was 83 pounds. Jesus. She was close to death. And our producers couldn't sit by anymore. And they basically said, until you can get this under control and get some help, you can't be on this show. Wow. So they wrote her as going to Europe on a, you know, school thing, a college, you know, trip research thing whatever and for the six seven eight episodes before our final one tracy was not there so she was brought back for that last episode and that was the first time we'd had her back on set in two months um so that was even more emotional um we were we were a wreck we bawled all day long no joke every single one of us and when we did that final scene for our audience that very last time I, we barely made it through every single one of us and the second we walked out that door we all just started breaking down alan and joanna held it together the best but joe started alan really didn't cry too much but he was a wreck and the rest of us were just shattered Wow. That, 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 without a doubt, that must've been the hardest thing in the world. But I mean, but you guys came back though. You guys had like a, like a little TV uh, movie. That no, we did back we two TV movies, which was mm -hmm. a wonderful chance to come back and work together. But the real sadness of it ending was not, it wasn't the work. It was, I mean, all those things sucked, you know, but it was, we were leaving our family. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably the worst thing you know, and you knew it was all going to change and we were leaving our family. Um, that was hard. So, but I mean, but, but I, mean I, I have a question. I'm wondering when they, when you guys did the two uh, TV movies, was that, did that serve as some sort of a, uh, you know, was there anything unresolved and those two TV movies served as some sort of closure for, for the show or, or was it just, did you feel that it was just, you know, a continuation of something that you, you, felt that you had already put the bed um no i thought i thought it was a nice continuation i thought they did a decent job at showing you know a growth in the characters and where they were now and i thought it was something that you know the fans definitely enjoyed and connected with and for us the show didn't end as amicably for some people as it could have Mm -hmm. uh, it's a well-known fact that during the last year or two of the show, Kirk was really going overboard with his faith at that point. Mm -hmm. um, he had cut most of the people who did not believe how he believed out of his life. Mm -hmm. And he just wasn't interacting with us at all anymore. He wasn't really a part of our lives. Um, that last year, I was really the only one on the set he still talked to. And when we f went to Montreal to film the very first reunion movie, the first day we were filming, as happens in Montreal, it was bright and sunny and no problem. And five minutes later, it was pouring. So mm -hmm. all of us, I mean, everybody grabs cameras, grabs equipment, and starts <laughs> running for vans. And we basically are just sitting in this van for like 15 minutes waiting for the cloud burst to go away. And Kirk took that opportunity to kind of apologize to all of us 
about his behavior those last couple of years. Um, you know, really took the chance to say, I, I screwed up. You know, I didn't understand what my faith was about. I was, I was not being a loving, kind person to you guys. I wasn't there for you. I turned my backs on you and I'm sorry. Well, that was really cool. It was, you know, I know for me and for most everybody in the cast, at least at that moment, everything was let go. It was any hurt that had been there before was just evaporated at that point. That's really cool, though, because, I mean, he ended up, you know, making amends with everybody, which is which is really, you know, it, that hardly ever happens. So that's really cool that he was able to go ahead and, you know, uh, you know, really um, mend his errors and, and, you know, everybody was able to accept him for that and be cool with him about that. But I mean, after after it was after the show ended, after the two uh, reunion episodes were done. Uh, I know that uh, you got, besides, you know, an a- besides being an actor, you also went to culinary school and you're a chef, which by the way, folks, let me tell you this much right now, I've eaten his food. I swear, you know, I, I mean, if, if I wasn't a, a straight man, I, I'd marry him. I'd marry him just simply for the food because it's freaking phenomenal. You know, you've been begging me to marry me for years anyway. <laughs> True, but I mean, your your you know your current wife Joni would probably kill me. So, <laughs> <laughs> which I love Joni, I love Joni Dad. So, and I don't want to ever anger her because yeah, I've heard stories about her, and yeah, I'm not I, I'm afraid of her. <laughs> She's the one to be afraid of. People yeah. are often afraid of me. I'm like, no, I'm not the one you need to watch out for. <laughs> no, and Joni, man, I got I got to tell you, you know the 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 woman that you chose. Uh, to be with you for the rest of your life. She is just an amazing woman. Joni Miller, she's she's an amazing human being. Um, you know, she's been with you through the hardest times and has had a really hard shell, uh, you know, considering cons- considering the stuff that she uh, went through. And man, I gotta, I gotta tell you, she's an amazing person. Like, she's an amazing friend to me, you know, and an amazing- I couldn't agree more, brother. You know, amazing I am mother. so blessed. I could not be more blessed to have- such an amazing woman who was such an amazing mom to our boys mm-hmm. and who is just the light of my life and my reason for breathing you know she has supported me and been there to fight for me and with me through everything that i've been through through my addiction through everything um you know a lot of ups and downs and her and i have been side by side through it all i'm a very blessed man no, and that's and that's and that's amazing. That's very rare to find somebody like your true ride or die. You know, it's very very difficult to find a person like that. But let's get back to the cooking portion of it. I know that you uh, that your grandmother was the one that first initially uh, sparked your passion in the culinary arts. Absolutely, um, my grandmother was a wonderful self trained chef. Um, in my early years, every year uh, for Easter for Thanksgiving and for New Year's, my grandmother would put on a dinner and a gathering for the people in our neighborhood. And it was all their friends, but it was also anybody who didn't have somewhere to be on the holiday. Anybody who didn't have a family to go to, even if you didn't know my gram, you knew somebody in the area who did know her and they'd told you about it. And the local homeless, I mean, she'd feed 200 people, 300 people each time. Wow. Her and I'd spend three days cooking, you know, turkeys and hams and pies and side dishes and just everything. And that was something she loved to do. And from three years old on, I was at her side in the kitchen. So, yeah, I got a real passion for it from her and a passion for cooking for people, you know, brightening people's day with a good meal. Um, You know, that's still all these years later, my favorite part of cooking for you know, cooking at all is, is getting to see somebody and how much they enjoy the food. And, you know, a good meal always raises your spirits. And, and your, your style, your specialty is actually Southern, uh, Southern style cooking. Well, that's one of them. I mean, I'm, you know, me, I'm so ADD. I, I jump on something else and I'm constantly training myself, but yes, I was classically trained French. I have also, you know, my family and my roots are Southern Cajun and Creole. Uh, so I've I've been cooking that most of my life as well. Oh my but, god, you know, your gumbo! Your gumbo is ridiculously freaking amazing. Like, oh th- lord! Thank you, brother. But yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I went. To, I was in China for a while uh, filming, and while I was there, I did a couple of apprenticeships at some local restaurants. 
Um, so I got to do one at a, a local classic Shanghainese restaurant and another one at a really nice French bistro in Shanghai um, that was kind of fusing Chinese and French cuisine. So I just, I'm constantly trying to learn as a chef. I am as ADD as they come. So I'll get bored with one style of cooking. It's one of the reasons why I teach the cooking private, uh, the private cooking classes. And one of the reasons I do catering and all that is it keeps me from getting bored. And I can, you know, one week I'm doing Italian and one week I'm doing Vietnamese. And, you know, it keeps my brain from getting uh, fried. No, without, without a doubt. I mean, and people can actually, they, they could contract you to do catering, right? Uh, catering, not so much anymore. I'm not doing my catering uh, by myself. I freelance for a couple different companies in LA as their head chef. But what they can book me for is the private party cooking classes and private cooking classes. Well, so, well, well, then you know what? Like, I, I, need to, I need for you to tell people how, then, how in the world they could book you. Well, they can, uh, they can find me on my Facebook uh, page, which is just, um, sorry, hold on one second here. My Facebook page, which is just Jeremy James Miller. Okay. And that has my appointments in my book now. Um, but they can also find me on Instagram, which is the real Jeremy Miller. And um, yeah, they can book me on there. The private classes, uh, especially the cooking parties are a ball. We do between, you know, four and 12 people. I come to your house or a house of one of your friends, or I have rental kitchens we can use as well. And basically they choose a style, a cuisine, a theme, whatever they want to learn. And we do like a three to four hour class where I teach them four or five different dishes. They get to eat everything, see how it's made. They get all the recipes and kind of get a history of the different dishes and stuff. And it's a real blast for me. I never knew I liked teaching, but I really enjoy doing these. And nice. people, you know, they can get hands on with it if they want, but most people just kind of kick back and have a glass of wine or have a cocktail and they just enjoy their night. They make a little party out of it. Nice, nice. And of course, you know, these are also ways, uh, these social media outlets are also ways for the people could also stalk you and, you know, see what, what else you're up to. Of course, of course. Nice, nice. No, that's really cool. Like, I mean, well, obviously, you know, I mean, I know that you do signings, obviously, right now with the current crisis that's going on, there's, you know, a lot of uh, signs have been canceled. But are you doing anything virtually that uh, maybe they could go ahead and, and, and follow or something like that, you know, cause everybody's doing something virtual right now to go ahead and, and make up for right. the fact that they can't see anybody. Well, at the moment I am actually participating in cameo. I don't know if you know the cameo app, but it is no. a wonderful, it is a wonderful shout out app oh, and okay. basically go on there and contract with numerous celebrities, musicians, athletes, and have them send a shout out to family, friends, coworkers, mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. like that. Nice, nice. Well, that's really cool that you're getting that done. I'm, currently, I'm currently on Cameo, and then I have a project. It is a web project that is all going to be filmed from our houses, basically. Um, and we'll see if anything comes of it. I can't talk about details yet or names, but it uh, looks like we will be starting filming that in the next week. And if it goes anywhere, I will definitely have updates for you. Nice, nice. Well, I definitely look forward in having you back on the Xander Effect, man. Uh, Jeremy Miller, thank you so much for being on the show. And of course, you're you know you're going to be back on anyway because you know football season is just around the corner. We got to talk about fantasy football. I mean, you're still my number one, you know, NFL, you know, fantasy football correspondent. So I will definitely be having you back on the show to talk a little bit about that. And yeah, but you know, see, here's the thing. I think with <laughs> you winning go. last year, here we go. I think with you winning last year. <laughs> I may have to stop giving you such good information. <laughs> well, you got to admit, you got to admit that, that the whole reason why I won, besides the fact of the matter that I'm that damn good, um, <laughs> is also because, of, you know, you went into auto draft in the middle of our draft. <laughs> Oh, you mean? Oh, you mean because half my team was on your team? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's another reason why I owe you my 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 uh, championship as well. That's all right. Just just give me a little footnote at the bottom of the trophy. I'll be no, fine. No worries. No worries. I got you covered on that one. <laughs> anyways well thank you so much brother thank you so much jeremy miller for being on the xander effect man uh i look forward to having you on again 
And who knows? You never know. I mean, our, our chemistry is so good together. I might even, you know, consider bringing you on as a co-host or something. I don't know. Figure that out. <laughs> hey, you know, if I can tolerate you that long, you know, it'll be fun. <laughs> Well, dude, trust me, no one can tolerate me that long. But you have <laughs> you you have done it very well, so we'll, we'll give you props for that one. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, thank you so much, man, and uh, we'll definitely have you on the show very soon again, man. Sounds good. You stay safe, brother. Love you. Love you too, man. Talk to you soon. Later. Later. Thank you so much, Jeremy Miller, for being on the Xander Effect. Loved interviewing. Lo I always love interviewing that guy, man, even though he's a pain in my... Anyways, <laughs> just kidding. No, great guy, great actor, great human being. I'm very happy that I had him on the show. In sports, UFC 249 is still going on without a hit, just like WrestleMania did. UFC 49 actually found a loophole, and that is doing the event at a closed uh, door home called Tachi Palace Casino Resort, just outside of Lemoore, California, near Fresno. Now, see, here's the here's the little bit of the technicality that they found, the loophole that they found. So. California's Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, the division of the state government that includes the California State Athletic Commission, uh, they had extended a ban on combat sports because of uh, the current crisis that's going on until the end of May. But the UFC found a venue that is outside of that jurisdiction, which is on Tachiyoku tribe uh, land. And it's owned by the Tachiyoku tribe. So it, it, uh, it's a part of the Santa Rosa Indian community. And they don't fall under the jurisdiction of the CSAC. So, and they don't even follow under the stay at home order uh, issued by, gov by Governor uh, Gavin Newsom. So, because of this loophole, UFC 249 has found a place to actually do the event. Dana White has found a place to do the event, and it's going to go on without a hitch. Now, this is for the uh, basically it it uh, main events. Uh, the the it's the feature uh, uh, championship between Tony Ferguson. It's going to be uh, Tony Ferguson versus. Justin Gaethje. So for the interim light heavyweight title, uh, or I'm sorry, for the interim uh, lightweight title, not light heavy, lightweight title. Uh, he was, uh, Ferguson was actually supposed to go up against uh, Khabib, but uh, Khabib has travel restrictions right now because of the current crisis, so he's not able to do the event. So therefore, uh, you know, he's been replaced by Justin. Justin will come in. He'll go ahead and take on Tony Ferguson at UFC 249, and uh, that's still going to happen this month. That's still going to happen without without any issues. It's going to be uh, airing. It's going to be airing April 18th, and uh, that's just how it's going to go. UFC 2. 49 is not going to go ahead and back down no matter what. So there's that. In other sports news, Ray Allen has issued a new challenge on social media. Uh, it's called uh, it's <laughs> it's pretty called it's pretty much called the hashtag my Jefferson, which is an homage to George Jefferson's uh, fro on the Jeffersons, and he's challenging all the greats, the, all the greats that have shaved heads, to go ahead and let their hair grow out uh, during this time of crisis. He posted a picture on Instagram and he says, "I wasn't gonna post uh, this, but two tears in a bucket." This is where I'm at with it, LOL. So I'm gonna ride hashtag my Jefferson out until the quote Rona kicks rocks. For those of you that don't know, I have cut my own hair my whole life. So it's been hard not to put the clippers to it. But when I look back at these pigs, I will remember the Rona. LOL, fish don't fry in the kitchen, beans don't burn on the grill. Took a whole lot of trying just to get up that hill. Now we're up in the big leagues getting our turn at bat. As long as we live, it's you and me, baby. There ain't nothing more. There ain't nothing wrong with that. I nominate all my bald or going bald brothers to let it grow. Y'all know who you are. LOL. And so he nominated a whole bunch of people, including Shaquille O'Neal was uh, was part of the 
was part of that uh, that uh, whole group of people. Uh, LeBron James was also in there as well, and yeah, he's just he's just having all uh, challenging them all to grow their hair out during this crisis. That was kind of funny. So we'll see how they all look with hair because I've never seen any of these guys with hair. So that's gonna be interesting to see them with hair. We'll see how that goes for them. Up next in video game news, Call of Duty Modern Warfare has has uh, the season three has dropped. I'll go ahead and give you guys details on what comes with the season three. But first, here is Quest Cross. Here go, she got it right go, here yeah. on the Xander Fan. That was Quest Cross. She got it right here on the Xander Effect. 
In video game news, brand new Call of Duty uh, Season 3 Battle Pass is here. It features Alex and Echo 3. Those are the new operators that are featured in the Battle Pass. And it comes with three new maps and two new weapons. The three maps include Talsic Backlot uh, in the middle of the Yurzikistan Desert. So it lies in an urban city. So it, uh, during a, in a construction project type of uh, area, um, it's a, actually a pretty interesting map. There's a lot of really cool spots where you could go ahead and sit out and be able to take people out when they come through. The other map is Hovik Sawmill. That one is like, it's literally like a little farm area with a sawmill that's going up in flames. It's like, a, I guess, a burning building. Uh, so that's a kind of a medium size, medium to a small size of map, uh, which is really interesting to play. The other one is the Aenea Incursion, which is almost similar to the palace that was in uh, in past uh, Call of Duty uh, maps. Uh, it has a similarity to a, to a palace. I forgot which one it was, but there was a there was a Call of Duty. I think it was uh, Modern Warfare. I think it was the first one uh, that had like a like a palace in it, and this palace is similar to that in the new DLC. The new weapons that are included are the SKS and the Renetti. So those are those are included um, for free. Actually, those are the free weapons that you get. Um, new skins include vehicle skins and milsim skins. So all of this is included in the battle pass. And of course, the battle pass does cost twenty dollars to go ahead and unlock everything that comes with the battle pass. Uh, so you guys might want to go ahead and check that out. So far, the game is playing pretty good. I'm still, again, I'm still a little upset as to what happened uh, over the weekend with uh, the double XP weekend and how Activision servers were still down. I still have not yet received a response from my tweet because that was the only way to get a hold of them. So that goes to show how much they really care about their uh, about their players. So there's that. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that right there. Thank you so much for uh, listening to the Xander Effect. Uh, appreciate you guys every single day. Remember to always stay safe. Remember to wear masks. Remember to wear gloves if you have to go out uh, to do uh, run errands that are that are essential to you. Make sure you always thank the essential workers. Again, continue to trend the hashtag AW movement, and that's the applaud workers movement where you go ahead and take a video of yourself applauding these essential workers that are risking their lives every single day to make sure that they provide service for us that we need for us and our families. That's the news in case you haven't heard it and remember music always always heals all see you next time live it up b taylor flow rider live it up The Xander Effect is powered by 5050 Global Music Inc. BMG and Sony Music The Orchard in association with Art19 Media.